celebrating 10 years of the Yes Music podcast, and this is episode 500. We have a real treat today because we are we are welcoming the keyboard legend Tony Kay, who was, of course, the first keyboardist with the band. Yes. So hello and welcome, Tony. Hi. Nice. Nice to be here. Uh, congratulations on uh, 10 years. That's that's great. Thank you very much. So we're here to talk about your debut solo album, End of Innocence, which is released on the 10th of September 2021 to mark the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And in the press release, it says that End of Innocence is a requiem for those who lost their lives and all those touched by the horrific events of 9-11. Hi there, Tony. How are you doing? Hi, Mark. So my first question is, you've been involved with music for many, many years with many bands, but why did it take this long to do the first solo record? Well, I guess it's kind of a complicated question, but an easy one too. I never really wanted to explore instrumental music. And it, it's really simple as that. Um, and I, I try to pull in the opportunity to, uh, to work with other people, you know, singers, songwriters, and uh, none of it quite worked out. And, you know, the other thing was really I, 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 didn't, I didn't have a purpose. I didn't, I didn't have a project. I didn't know what to, what to write about. Dark Side of the Moon had already been written, <laughs> and and where do you where do you go actually from there? You know, apart from maybe to Six Wives, and <laughs> um, you know that had already been done too. So it, it was really you know finding the project, and it it, it really n- never happened for me. And of course, you know, being busy with uh, with other things and. Uh, and it, it it was going to happen, I think, with um, with a record label that um, Lee Abrams had uh, set up in the in the late eighties. But uh, hmm. one thing or another, it didn't work out. And really, and you know, and until that day in in New York, I I suddenly found you know the the, the purpose and the project. Um, that I wanted. And, and of course I sort of been retired for, for a number of years after the last yes album. And it, it suddenly happened and I got out my keyboards from flight cases that were in the garage and started playing again. It's an amazing story. This album actually existed, first of all, as a YouTube version, didn't it? How, how has it evolved from there? Well, I mean, it's, it started in the beginning, um, the, the, the day after uh, 9-11, and um, a couple of three pieces, which are actually on the album now, the, the more orchestral pieces w- were the first things that... Um, you know, that I wrote. And um, Mm. over the years, I I wrote other things and I had about 40 minutes of music. And I I always pictured it as the day was in in a video context, because obviously it was a very visual thing. And, um, you know, suddenly a, a, a few years after iMovie came out and uh, I bought a new computer and there was iMovie and there was the perfect, uh, before that, the editing and uh, working with, with visuals was almost impossible, really. There was just not the technology or the equipment. And iMovie was um, a revelation uh, to me. And I learned a little about the technique of um, editing and actually put that 40 minutes of of music to video, which is what came out on YouTube. Why write about 9-11? I mean, I understand the want to pay tribute to what happened to those people, but where? But was there a more personal reason for you than that? No, no, there there wasn't. It, it, It was... You know, I was at my home in Los Angeles and uh, my friend in, in D.C., in Washington, D.C., phoned and said, you've got to put on the TV. And um, and the, the day transpired. And it really just inspired me to, uh, to set up my keyboards and, and start playing again. I, I don't even, mm-hmm. I can't even describe it, really. 
it was an emotional thing that that stirred me musically. It's amazing, and the album is truly extraordinary. I think from the music right through to the Roger Dean artwork, and I found it deeply affecting reading the notes in the the booklet alongside listening mm-hmm. to the music. And I'd like to read out, if you don't mind, the quotation you've included in the the sleeve notes from the Dalai Lama. And he says, peace does not mean an absence of conflicts. Differences will always be there. Peace means solving these differences through peaceful means, through dialogue, education, knowledge, and through humane ways. So what's the main message you want people to take away from this as an immersive listening experience? Well, uh, you know, it was um, a lot of the music is... um, Obviously, because of of what it represents, a very emotional uh, thing, and, and it, you know, it it may be a little somber, and I tried to make it uplifting too. Um, you know, but that was really the uh, the whole experience of of what I was trying to convey. The, the album, of course, really should be listened to in its entirety. Uh, you can't really yeah. just, you know, pick out a track and because it 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 is the story. It it portrays piece by piece what happened that day, and of course, you know, beyond. Because I I decided to take it into you know what happened after and the political uh, war situation that, that happened. So yeah. Yeah, it, it it was it was a, an emotional uh, reaction that I, that I I just had to write about. Totally makes yeah. sense. Um, as a songwriter myself, I found it fascinating how you wrote these songs. I mean, using the memories of the events that happened leading up to nine eleven, kind of ensured that the music would be amazing. How important was the imagery of these events in the writing process? Well, it was all important, and 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 uh, you know, actually. When I when I was originally writing the uh, right at the beginning, obviously the the imagery of that day was very powerful, and I I wrote it to those uh, images. You know that's why yeah. that's that's why the the video became so important to me uh, a few years later. You know every 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 piece in on the album is is a, about a, a part of that day and i wrote specifically for that part so so basically each image was the kind of catalyst to start the music basically yes it was it set the uh it set the the, the image set the tone you know the obviously for the the, the piece that is called 911 is is um portrays really what happened on one of the planes i actually put in the uh the communications with the, you know, from the plane to the tower in in the piece, and it's yeah. obviously very. And every every piece in on the album is uh, is about a particular part of that day. So it, it's mainly instrumental, as you've already said. But tell us about the song "Sweetest Dreams," which comes just after the middle of the album. <laughs> which, uh, except my wife. Yeah beautiful song we of course m- met two weeks after the the event on 9-11 yeah. and so there was a um a, a ter- terrific sort of importance to her coming into my life and starting uh, this project mm-hmm. and um you know she's a very talented singer songwriter we did an al- album together mm-hmm. and um i i asked her you know, almost right at the beginning, would she? I, I needed a, I needed a piece to to represent what the first responders, the firefighters, uh, after the event happened, and what what was happening to them. Mm. And uh, she sat down and wrote "Sweet Dreams," and it was recorded probably three or four weeks after the uh, the event. Uh, we I haven't talked about it, but I had no recording equipment, and um, and I, I was actually recording on a an eight track uh, cassette deck that I used to uh, take on the on the road. Mm. So that song, as it is on, as it comes on the album on this album, was the original 
a track cassette mix. <laughs> and it, it, it's quite amazing that it is, is still 20 years later yeah. the way that it was then. <laughs> I couldn't do anything more to it. it. It was all mixed. The vocals were done, everything, the piano, the Rhodesy piano and the strings and everything. Yeah. And, um, of course, it, it was eventually... Uh, uh, transfer to dig- digital performer. I try to make it sound a little, a little better than an eight-track uh, cassette. <laughs> but and actually, the piece at the beginning, the uh, the overture, yeah. that was also recorded on a, uh, an eight-track. I never guessed it. Listening to it sounds really good. But then you know those eight-track recorders are pretty, pretty decent if you come to think about it. Um, the songs on this are very mellow and somewhat sad in some ways in the mood. Did you find that a difficult emotion to project in the music? You know, um, um, musically, I didn't, I, I didn't want to write in minor keys. Mm-hmm. You know, that was a, that was a sort of <laughs> challenge for me. And actually, you know, apart from the, 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 the sort of triumph fanfare at the end, which is obviously in a very major, uh, very mm-hmm. major chord, uh, I really tried, you know, not to be very, very specific in, in writing minor chords. Um, I don't know whether you think that I succeeded in that, but actually not just the, the, the more melancholy, sadder orchestral songs, but, but actually the, you know, the more intense, you know, like the war theme at the end. Yeah. Um, and the, the piece right at the beginning that, that, that portrays what was happening at the airport. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When it was being infiltrated by these terrorists, Mm-hmm. And, and also the you know the plane thing, which is uh, theme, which is very d- dynamic. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, it was a, it was a, a challenge to actually write like that. Yeah, I got a lot of inspiration from Van Gallus. So uh-huh. yeah. some of the drama of the music uh, is down to the percussion, which was supplied by someone you've worked with a lot, of course, Jay Shellen. Was he the obvious choice to come in and do that for you? Of course, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jay's uh, Jay's my friend. He's been a friend. I've known him since he was seventeen years old. He Gosh. played for for a short time in Badfinger when I. Actually, you know, played with Badfinger at the end of the uh, 70s. So, uh, Jay and I are always in uh, in contact, and of course, you know, through the circa situation with uh, obviously the uh, the the 50th anniversary, uh, which I was fortunate enough to be invited to uh, mm. to play along on the, uh, at the end mm. <laughs> during yeah. the, uh, the encores playing uh, Yes album songs, yeah. which is a whole other thing. But uh, uh, it, it was great to uh, to be back on stage with uh, with Jay. He's such a, a, a great guy and, a, you know, such a great drummer, dynamic drummer. Mm. He did a great drum solo at the beginning of that uh, 9-11 track. Yeah, absolutely. That was really amazed at how detailed the stories for each of these songs were. I mean, how detailed each person's stories were. Like, for example, that Jim Gattenberg, who was attending his last day of work at the World Trade Center. How long did it take for you to do this type of research? That was not me. That was um, a great uh, addition to, you know, what, I, I sent the album to uh, to Roger Dean, hmm. and um, I, I of course had reconnected with him on the, on the, uh, Cruise to the Edge, yeah. and uh, you know we talked Badger. He had the original Badger um, hmm. one light Badger painting there, and uh, and so we reconnected, and I I sent him the album, and uh, that's what he sent me back, and and I thought, wow, that is. Uh, hmm. That is perfect. That's how I imagine that day. Graphically, it, it could have gone in a lot of directions, but uh, Roger being Roger. And, of course, he works and has worked closely on other projects with Michael Inns, whom I was introduced to by him and, uh, and the S management. Right. He was the one who came up with the idea of the booklet, and it was a solution to me to explain the songs 
It does work remarkably well. I, I really enjoyed it. Oh, good. I'm, I'm glad. I, I, he did a great job and a lot of research on those um, vignettes. Mm. People come to expect me always to ask some sort of gear nerd question. So this is my gear nerd question for you, Tony. Uh, so <laughs> what keyboards did you use on this recording? I mean, I really loved the piano sound you had on that New York City blues song. Uh-huh. Well, it's... It started out, of course, you know, I unpacked the, uh, the Yes keyboard setup. <laughs> and, um, you know, there was, there was a, a lot of keyboards. And, uh, you know, I didn't really know which, which way to go. I still had the Oberheims and the, and the, and the different Yes keyboards. And the, the Hammond? The, did you still have your Hammond? I, I, at that time, I did, yes. But it, 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 wasn't, uh, it wasn't unpacked. It was still, uh, still non-operational. <laughs> they, hmm. They're quite difficult to, uh, to deal with. <laughs> um, so I didn't, I didn't really have a, a, a Hammond. What I had was a couple of keyboards that, um, that I, I used to have on the road and sort of carried around with me, and they were basically really cheap uh, Korg keyboards. Yeah. But they're perfect for, you know, playing around. And, uh, and actually, sounds good. they did a good job. Mm-hmm. And a, a lot of the uh, that early orchestral stuff was the Korg keyboards. Mm-hmm. Um, the, rest of, the rest of the album really... It is down to my personal favorite, which is the Roland. Ah. And I have um, I have the Phantom uh, X7, and yes. um, you know, in in circa, we we started out with the with the Hammond, and uh, it eventually got a little uh, too crazy to carry around. So <laughs> I switched to the uh, the Roland uh, VK8, <laughs> and uh, originally actually put it through a Leslie cabinet. Oh, uh, nice. And that that was the uh, that was the setup that I used uh, for most of the circus stuff. Then I got rid of the uh, the Leslie cabinet and got that uh, little gizmo called the ventilator, mm-hmm. which is uh, a, a Leslie sounder like. And basically, that's what the uh, what most of the Hammond uh, on the album is. Right. But I love the the uh, I love the Roland uh, that that piano. Of course, the, they they have great uh, great piano sounds, different piano sounds on the Phantom. And I, I've had the Phantom for many years, and actually, I I don't see really a reason to uh, to go to anything else. It's it's the perfect instrument to me. But when I see Van Gallus and his, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it certainly makes me uh, makes me think. And I, I I did have the good fortune to go and uh, see. Actually, John Anderson uh, took me to. Uh, uh, to, to go see him um, when he was, I don't know, he was rehearsing or he, he, rec- he was recording actually mm. at the Beverly Hills Hotel in a, in a, in a, a little chalet in, 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 the, in the grounds of the hotel. And he had his setup there yeah. that literally blows your mind. <laughs> and uh, you know, he's just amazing. Okay, well, that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you for answering those questions about your new solo album. I do re- recommend it to all guest fans and anyone else, yes. actually. It really is a, a remarkable piece of work, so thank you. Well, thank you. This is Brian Sullivan from New York State, USA, and you're listening to the Yes Music Podcast. We've just got a few questions about uh, Yes. Starting off with, oh. in, yeah, in 2018, <laughs> I attended an event organised by Dave Watkinson, which took place in the basement of what was the Lucky Horseshoe Cafe in London. I did hear about that. Yeah, and Bill Bruford came and unveiled a, play, a plaque celebrating 50 years of Yes. What memories do you have of rehearsing there in those earliest days? I do have memories of it, and... Um... I have no memory of how it uh, transpired, mm. except that uh, it was something that I think John and, and Jack Barry and uh, mm. John G at the Marquee Club. Yeah. And um, a lot of that was set up, you know, with the intention of rehearsing and playing at the Marquee. So oh. it was uh, that kind of setup that, uh, that transpired. 
I have no real memories. I have memories of um, being super impressed with Peter. Mm. I love playing with Peter. He was uh, he was such an uh, innovative uh, guitar player. You know, he was such an an, an, an inspiration to the the beginning of the band. Of course, Chris is Chris, and uh, Chris was doing his thing. And what can you say? Mm. And John. Of course, we we didn't really have any songs back then, and uh, <laughs> and I guess playing other people's songs and mm-hmm. making crazy arrangements out of them mm-hmm. was something that really transpired into what the, what the band became. So as the band rushed around the country and in Europe in a van, often at furious speeds, you famously appeared on the cover of the Yes album with a cast on your leg. Now, apart from that crash, and that, which led to that injury, do you have any other crazy adventures that were typical of that time? Well, there were, there were plenty, of, plenty of adventures, but... Um, <laughs> Mostly transpired into other crashes. <laughs> <laughs> there were several other crashes. Um, one specifically, Chris was always driving. I was always in the uh, in the front seat, mm-hmm. and the, the, the rest of the band in the back. And famously, we were speeding down an autobahn in, in Germany. Chris fell asleep. We left the road, hit a ditch full of water. Thank goodness, and uh, which actually you know slowed the car down. And the, the police arrived and, and announced that there were five girls in a car <laughs> at the side of the road to, to the hospital. So I wasn't actually hurt in that one, but uh, uh, a couple of others. And of course, the, the, the one that I think we were on our way back from uh, Cornwall or Devon. And, uh, you know, we hit, we hit a freeway, a motorway uh, that had been half blocked off and dressed in on no, it, it was in a, a, a pouring down with rain, and we didn't see the notice or whatever. And we hit another car head on, which oh. was pretty traumatic. So, was that one the one that finally made Bill Bruford say, "I'm taking my own vehicle to gigs"? Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, it was. Chris was not a to be entirely trusted uh, driving. <laughs> well. You've already said a little bit about those those amazingly strong personalities who were involved at that time with the band. But did anything irritate you about other members of the band in in terms of rehearsing or did anything get on your nerves? Actually, you know, the, but I, I know there's a lot of stories about the uh, about how the band got on and all the rest of it. But actually, you know, for for, for the longest time, really, and even after I. Uh, I, I left the band. We got on pretty well. Mm. It was a, a band of mutual respect. And I know a lot of fans are sort of crazy about, you know, the way that the bands are, uh, the two bands are, well, one band right now, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, the fact is that uh, there's a lot of love and respect in the, in, in the present, yes. And it's really it's really nice to see. Mm-hmm. I got to see it firsthand. And it's, you know, it's, it's great what the Billy and, uh, and Jay and Jeff. It's great to get along with another keyboard player, I've got to say. <laughs> yeah, he is, the, he is the nicest guy. So it, it worked out really well. Okay. That's great. So going on with that sort of positive vibe, let's ask you this question then. So what is your favorite Yes album that you performed on and which was the most rewarding to record in the studio? Favorite album? Probably 90125. Wow. Which is such a great time. Of, of, of course, the, there were there were problems with myself and uh, and Trevor Horn and recording that album. But you know, the the band was so happy to get together. Yeah, mm. and um, people forget that we actually re- rehearsed that album for I don't know, nine nine months or something. Mm. As um, what was the band called there? <laughs> not, not the band. Cinema. Cinema. That's it. And it was uh, it was you know so great to uh, to be in London and, and in, in that whole sort of eighties London environment and uh, it, it was a very a very cool time. Mm-hmm. 
not forgetting the the problems that that went down with it. Yeah. But I think it's a very it's a very good uh, album. Then let me ask you this then, and I'm curious for your answer on this, Tony. Do you have a favorite Yes album that you didn't play on? I think probably um, uh, Patrick's venture into into the band. Relayer? Yeah, really. I really like Relayer. Uh, Patrick is such a such a great keyboard player, so innovative and so technically uh, proficient. And but but at the same time, you know, a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of heart and soul. I. I actually identify with him more than than maybe Rick. Uh, although, of course, Rick has done great great things with the band. Notwithstanding Jeff being my favorite keyboard player in the band, mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. so I would say I would say Relay uh, that's, Tales. That's fantastic. Mm. I mean, I, I feel very pleased to hear you say that because Relay <laughs> is my favorite Yes album. So there you go. Oh, it is. Okay, excellent. All right. Great minds. Now, Doug mm-hmm. Curran is a is a listener to the YMP and a, and a great friend of the YMP, and he actually helped to set up this interview with you, Tony. And he mentioned a, a story which he was keen for me to ask you about. Now, this is about Janis Joplin chasing you around London in April 1969 after Yes had opened for her at the Albert Hall. And apparently you hid in the kitchen of the speakeasy. Is there, is there any truth in that? She was a, she was a little persistent. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say. Yeah. And uh, yes, the, uh, the guys in the speakeasy did hide me try to uh i won't go into it any anymore but um yes. finally calmed her down and sent her on her way <laughs> notwithstanding that you know she was amazing yes 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 absolutely. and a great a great performer we supported um her at the Albert hall i think it was after the uh cream concert we did mm-hmm. we did cream at the Albert hall too yeah, I th- yeah, I think it was uh, later. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, yeah, that's where that's where I met her yeah. over a bottle of uh, Southern Comfort. Aha, uh-huh. right. <laughs> so I was watching one of my favourite early Yes uh, videos, which is the 1971 Beat Club video where you played "Yours Is No Disgrace," and I noticed John Anderson playing the theme on a, a small keyboard or a pedal board or something that he had in front of him. And there has long been talk of your preference, Tony, for piano and Hammond organ, um, particularly at this time. But, I mean, for example, you played some fantastic Moog on the Yes album. So it's all a bit of a myth, isn't it, that you didn't like the synths? You know, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of truth in, uh, in, 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 the, in the conspiracy that I, I was, um, I departed the band, uh, you know, because Rick was very much into uh, alternative keyboards. But this, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of truth, and I was not a big fan. I thought they, they, they both sounded, the Mellotron and the Mini Mood, sounded out of tune mm. to my delicate ears. They were certainly difficult to actually keep in tune. Yeah. But of course, I I I did play a little and, and had both Moog and Mellotron in uh, in Badger in, and in, mm. in fact on one light Badger they're definitely there. It was not long after that that I threw them off stage. Wow! Yeah, that, that must have been a that must have given you a hernia doing that though. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a little bit of a Keith uh, a little bit of a Keith Moon thing and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was the uh, you know and, and, until the eighties, until the early eighties. That was the end of uh, uh, mini moves and melatrons for me. So, speaking of the eighties, we spoke to Casey Young some time ago about his keyboard work on the nine hundred one two five tour. What was it like working with him? Casey was very uh, he was he was a talented guy, and um, you know he he had quite it was the beginning of, of MIDI. And uh, uh-huh. we put the, uh, a whole sort of mini keyboard section together. You know, his his job was really to keep it all working. Mm. And of course, the, the, the emulator samples and uh, all of that stuff tried try to replicate 901 through 5. And of course, most of the, the keyboards that he 
he played were vocal uh, synthesizers mm. and a, yeah. a lot of the vocals on uh, on the 90125 tour were were you know vocal uh, mm. vocal synths so he was busy uh, following vocals yeah that's fascinating were you aware at the time or afterwards about the daft conspiracy theaters surrounding what he did on that tour i i had no idea right <laughs> The only the only thing that I that I, I remember because I'm not as on social media, so no. um, I have no idea really what went down with him and the and and the Yes fans. Mm, mm. Um, the only thing that I remember was uh, uh, Billy phoning me one day saying that, that he got into huge arguments on, online, uh, probably Facebook, right, mm. with the Yes fans that. that had been convinced by Casey that he was doing most of the keyboards mm. on, uh, on tour, which obviously was completely, you know, insane. But okay. thank you, Billy, for defending me. So let's let's step away from Yes for a moment. I've always loved that YouTube video of Circa live performing that epic Yes medley that you guys did. Mm-hmm. Um, having played Yes songs from so many different eras in that, is there a keyboard player whose style you enjoyed playing? I think probably Patrick, uh, you know, has been my favorite. Uh, until of late, you know, I, I have a lot of a uh, lot of respect for uh, for Jeff. I, I think he's I think he's underrated. Um, I think the, a lot of Yes fans uh, don't give him enough credit. Mm. He probably has to prove a, a, a little more, certainly in the recorded field, mm-hmm. and and hopefully their new album. Quest. I, I listened to the the, the single, yeah. and you know it's it's great. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. great, and uh, he's going to be fine. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the one thing about that circa video that I think was very beneficial overall, especially towards you, Tony, was that it showed once and for all that you know there was always that rumor that you know yes, we're always trying to upgrade their members and blah 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 blah. But it shows very clearly that all the stuff that yes did even after you were gone, you could easily play on keyboards like you played fragile stuff you played all kinds of stuff and very easily from what i saw and i I thought it was just fantastic how you performed it well thank you it was uh it was a fun thing to uh uh it's not easy it was not (laughs) easy to perform that i think you know the band including alan of course Mm. Did a great job in that. I think minutes long, yeah. almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it the- pretty much covered uh, the entire history of yeah. So it was uh, it was interesting. But uh, thank you for. I mean, mm. I, I really enjoyed playing it. Well, we've already spoken about the nine one two five tour and another massive tour that you were part of. Of course, was Union. Did you enjoy the touring lifestyle? The lifestyle or that particular tour? Well, start with the lifestyle. I mean, I always, I always enjoyed uh, being on the road. Um, right. Yeah. But that particular tour, it was really fun. It was, it was, you know, Rick and I got on really well. We, ah. uh, we talked about, you know, splitting the parts and what each could play and everything. And, uh, you know, the band with eight people uh, mm-hmm. sounded fantastic. It yeah. was very, very enjoyable. And, of course, it it turned into a very uh, successful tour, the, you know, mm-hmm. at the beginning, really, because of, you know, what went down with the union and the, and the disagreements and the management mm-hmm. and the record companies. And, uh, I mean, uh, and of course, the, the the band was pretty split at, at that time too. Mm. Uh, the fact that it came together was pretty uh, pretty amazing, and the fact that it, it the, the band sounded so good was you know a great bonus. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I saw the Union tour. Uh, and that was my first ever Yes show that I went to. And I was always curious, how was it particularly with you and Rick integrating the keyboard stuff? Like, was this something that you guys got along with and kind of got along, like figuring out easily? Or was it sort of a hair pulling thing? 
No, it, it was it was very easy. I mean, there was there were, there were no disagreements at all. I remember Rick saying, "Really, that's how yours is a no disgrace goes." <laughs> and I had no idea. I've been playing it wrong all these years. <laughs> it was the, the you know the the melody, the sort of moogie melody yeah. uh, at, the, at the beginning, and he he'd been playing the uh, the chord inversion wrong. <laughs> That was pretty funny. Yeah. Rick's hilarious anyway. And, you know, no one was really taking it too, um, too seriously. Uh, it was easy because there were two people apart from Chris to cover all the parts. So yeah. it was uh, pretty good. So have you got yourself a, a copy of the massive box set of, of Yes Union 30? No, I'm waiting for someone to uh, to give it to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an amazing thing to be part of, having a, an entire flight case with, uh, <laughs> with you yeah. playing in it. Yes, really. I mean, I, you know, to finish off my, uh, my little collection here, mm. I, I think someone should actually, uh, I'm, I'm not sure who that person is, though, so I... Right, well, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll put in a good word for you, Tony, when we when we see them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Listen, it's been absolutely brilliant, Tony. We've gone slightly over time, but you are very kind to to say that we could do so. That's okay. Uh, it's been a wonderful time speaking to you for our for our tenth anniversary and episode five hundred, and we've really enjoyed it. Yes, and uh, congratulations on your on your anniversary. That's quite a quite a, a milestone. Yes, really. well, thank you. Not quite fifty years. But, N- not uh, quite. No. Uh, <laughs> no we'll, perhaps we'll get there though. Who's? We'll give you. A, we'll give you some time. All right. Uh, but it's been brilliant. We could talk to you all day and all night, of course. And um, it would be lovely if you came back on the podcast in the future and t- talked some more about it. yes. I would love to. Yes, um, we'll we'll see what happens with the uh, with end of innocence mm. and uh, and maybe do a follow up yeah. uh, down the road. Great. Fantastic. All right. So thank you very much indeed, Tony K. Great. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tony. Okay. Bye. Bye. Happy birthday, YM. <laughs>